thousand years ago and reinforced many, many times. Physician, heal thyself. Stand up. Be accountable. Be competent. Stop acting as children. Stop looking for gurus. Stop blaming other people. Stop coming up with excuses not to deal with it. Stand up and be competent is the single message that we are trying to express. And we're being attacked for it. (laughs) We're being attacked for it because people don't want to stand up. They're happy not to stand up. They're happy to remain victims. They're happy to remain children. It's a challenge to stand up and be competent because it means you have no one else to blame but yourself. So we know this time and we know for certain this time that we are called to be active participants and not passive observers. History is not a spectator sport. And participate in this moment. Now, we're not even asked to rally armies of hundreds of thousands of people. And and you'll hear this time and time again. People will say, what can one man do? What can one woman do against a system as vast and as powerful as the one that we face? The one that has built FEMA camps, just waiting for the day that the earth changes come to fill them with unhappy souls. What, what, What possibly can one man or woman do? Well, here's the thing. Judges are not bad people. Police are not bad people. FEMA employees are not bad people. But the system works on a brilliant, but ultimately um, unsustainable premise. No one is permitted to be free. No one. That's why judges don't break from the ranks. That's why lawyers don't buck the system. That's why police don't say enough is enough because they are told by their superiors, no one gets out for free. No one gets out of the system. So when one truly stands free and crushes those Sesta KV trusts and stands as we must, then they, the judges, the clerks, the prosecutors, the police, the army, the military, the intelligence, the FBI, the CIA, the FEMA employees, all of them see for themselves that they too, if they were not cowardly enough, can stand and be free. And you watch what happens then. So when someone says to you, what can one man or woman do? One man that stands up and is no longer afraid. One woman who stands up competently in the law and is no longer afraid can change the world. And if a hundred can do it, then they can definitely change the world. So nothing we talk about is based on some naivety. Nothing we talk about is based on some kind of cult, some kind of uh, worship, some kind of guru. It is as plain and simple as the words who were taught as children. Stand up, physician, heal thyself, participate. You you cannot be told clearer than now, you are being called, not by me. You are being called. If you believe there is a higher power, then the prophecies of the world, there has never been a time that they coalesce. And if a man or woman, with all that they can see, still chooses not to participate, then that is their journey. Don't judge them. We're not here to judge. But focus on yourself and your family and your friends and your community. So in that, we all have a part to play. And one of those parts to play is to ensure that lawfully and legally the procedures that end the world, as is foretold, take place. Now, property is a fiction. Person is a fiction. Law, positive law, is a fiction. And I know that many good people listen to it and many people who have been skilled and schooled in the free man movement consider the concept of fiction abhorrent. And I just wish to point out a a, a point to them. The highest realisation that you can possibly get to is that life is a dream 
but a dream has rules. Everything is fiction. Everything is divine. So fiction itself is not the enemy. Ideas in the, are the enemy. Bad ideas are the enemy. And I think this is, again, an important point for all of us to realize. When you face a judge, don't be disrespectful because the judge isn't the enemy. It's the ideas that run that court that are our enemy. Don't disrespect the prosecutor. They're almost certainly not a bad person. They almost certainly didn't go into law to say, let me you know, screw people over. They did it because probably they felt that they could make a difference, just as the, the lawyers feel they can make a difference. Not everyone in that system is, is totally motivated by greed, but they are sucked into it. They are tricked into becoming addicts of the system, and then they're kept in line with fear and, and the cost of 20 years or 30 years of a career going up in smoke if one deviates. So the system is the problem. So property is a concept. It's not an evil concept on its own, but it has been corrupted because property has a number of, of concepts around it, such as ownership. And ownership says that no one can really own property in this temporal realm. There's no law in physics to say, I can own any of you or you can own me. I can use something and I can have a right of use to use something and I can call that property. That's what property is. Property is rights of use. And in fact, I can document it and I can sell that right of use. And I can sell it as a title, legal title or equitable title, tenancy. So the only entity, the only concept that can own anything is the divine. Therefore, the group that claims supreme connection to the divine ultimately holds the global franchise for property rights. And that is what Rome set itself up to be, the global franchise for property rights. That's why they went to the extent of creating the canon law. It's why they went in in the 16th century created this entirely fictitious set of law, corpus juris um, civilis, you know, Justinian laws, which was completely manufactured by the Jesuits. It's complete rubbish. And they did that because they set themselves up as the controlling franchise for property rights. And then property cascades down. Rights is a top-down concept, not a bottom-up concept. It's a top-down concept. From the divine to then the first representative body. Then from that representative body to those bodies that pledge allegiance to that body. And then down and down and down and eventually to our level, if we're lucky. Or in the case of the Cesta KVs, where they take those minimal rights and even take those from us so that we have nothing. We hold no property in their system. We own nothing. We're slaves. A claim comes from the bottom up. A claim is where one of us stands up and says, I am not a slave and I'm competent. So a claim of right is the measure of those two things. Well, the covenant of one heaven is not just simply a nice idea with a few crazy things involved. It is with canon law, an absolute claim that the covenant and the society of one heaven and no other, certainly not Rome or any other institution, holds the exclusive rights of property for the divine. And that holding that incredibly important role, we will convey and are conveying and have conveyed those property rights through entities right down to every man and woman on this planet living in and, and will live in the future. And that there is absolutely no corruption in that system. There is no insertion of, of some kind of claim or some kind of godship, some kind of messiahship. We are approaching this as a steward humbled by the role should do and ensure this is done properly. Now, with those rights we must then address those that no longer hold control of property through any right, but are tenants or they are squatters. So we are conveying that very clearly. We're not writing to them to say you've been bad boys and girls. We're writing to them as the owners and stewards I should say, the owners and stewards of legal title 
from the divine and they are not. So December the 21st, which was the winter solstice, which was a lunar eclipse, was the day that the second horseman, Gabriel, representing the moon and lunar eclipses representing significantly an arrival or an uh, event of Gabriel. So the event represented the arrival of Archangel Gabriel, the second horseman. December 21st is when we gave not just notice, but when we stripped many of those in the world of their right of ecclesiastical uh, rights because of their dishonor. And we did that because we hold the authority. We hold it, they do not. Now again, people say, how can you make these claims? How can you possibly say these things because these people in power? It has nothing to do with how big is your palace, how big is your temple. It is argument. It is logic. And it is the hand of the divine unmistakably presented. Now I'll talk about the fact that, that the most powerful groups in the world are well, well aware of this and have even telegraphed back to us their positions. This is not some crazy plan. They are well aware of this. But we must continue to focus on the things that we must focus on. So I'm not going to, in the time we have, because we are limited in time, go through each of the particular deeds, but you'll see them there. There is the first, Pactum in Pietatis Talmudi, representing the sin of hate to all the rabbi, kazars, Venetians, parasites and menashe that have dishonoured the divine. And then we'll see the second sacred deed of divine protest dishonour, Factum in Pietatis Romanus Pontifex, which is to the Roman Catholic Church, excluding the Jesuits, I'll explain that in a second, representing the sin of greed. And you'll see the third sacred deed if you go to one-heaven.org and click on the uh, seven deeds of divine protest. You'll see Factum in Pietatis Attorney Regis, which again uh, is to the Roman Catholic Church, but is also to the uh, kings and uh, all those with title. And that represents the sin of avarice. And the fourth is Factum in Pietatis Templum Regis, to the bar, to the bar society, bar associations, the temple bar, the house of lords, the people who usurp the law, hold in, uh, themselves in courts, claim to represent the law, and have been imprisoning good men and women now for far too long. And they represent the sin, an awful sin, the sin of perfidy. And then we have the fifth sacred deed, Factum Impietatis Illuminati, representing the dis grave dishonour by the Venetians, the Khazarian parasites, their agents, in the form of the um, Knights Templar and other um, groups of Canaanites. And that's the sin of arrogance. And the second last we see in the sixth deed, Factum in Pietatis Arabia Regis, in all the Arabian royal families and agents, who on the one hand tell their loyal subjects that if one of them was to drink alcohol or one of them was to defy the laws of Islam, that they will be executed or lose their hand or something worse. And yet behind in private, they get drunk and sleep with prostitutes and absolutely defile their own laws. I mean, it is outrageous that these people hold any position. And so they are all in dishonour, all of them, and they represent the sin of gluttony, most apt. And the last but not least, factum in pietatis universitas, also in respect to the Rorik Pact, being the largest global corporations who do not care one iota for the future of this world. They care for nothing but themselves, their profits, their home, and, they, and stripping the value from their own companies. Totally and utterly out of control. And they represent the sin of lust. They're the seven. Now, 
if you don't hear of one, and I'm going to talk about the Jesuits in a moment, but if you don't hear 